listen to the sound of it, semiconductor. What the fuck is a semiconductor? It both conducts and it insulates at the same time. It carries signal. This thing is a fucking miracle. The power that it contains is incredible. Maybe it's, it's wizardry and now we don't want to name it, but it drives everything. Semiconductors impact every single aspect of your life. Whatever device you're watching this on is relying on semiconductors. Your world would not look the same as it does if semiconductors didn't exist. If you were to ask me what's the most important product in the world, I would say it's food, because it's the basic need we have as humans. But the reality of the world we live in right now is there wouldn't be food without semiconductors. But the whole process of getting from grain to bread involves semiconductors. They're in farming, in food production, in logistics. Without semiconductors, we would have no food. It maps the relations of power in our world. It maps out the dynamics between labor, capital, and political power. And so in order to understand the world we live in, semiconductors is a really great starting point. People first started discovering electricity, they had two classifications of materials. They had metals that conducted electricity, we call those conductors, and then they had insulators that blocked the flow of electricity. And as we developed um, more understanding of materials, that there was a range of materials in between that were semi-conductive. The usefulness of them is not that they're either good metals or good insulators, it's the fact that we can actually cause them to turn on or off their conductivity by, say, the application of some external force, like of an applied voltage or something of that nature. And that switch is the fundamental element in a microchip. And microchips are used in computers, smartphones, to perform calculations. And so if we think about how we interact with the world, the kind of things that stores information, they would use semiconductors, or the kind of things that make certain kinds of calculations, like a microwave and our refrigerators and a lot of these everyday appliances today also have these kinds of logics that are built into them, and they also use semiconductors. What we tend to call digitalization is a process where more and more digitally organized ways of transmitting information, energy, or exchanges are being embedded in what we've called our normality. And so we underestimate how many of those processes are by now mediated by such devices and how these tiny little things built into them are essentially their powering engine. Back in the, the early 60s, we only had individual discrete devices and that limited the complexity of what we could do with them. During the space race, we needed specialized computers that could actually adjust the uh, control systems for rockets in order to keep them from going off target and basically destroying themselves. So we had to develop these integrated circuits. An integrated circuit is nothing more than taking these individual discrete devices, transistors primarily, and putting them on the same semiconductor platform. And that's the start of what we are living through today, which is the semiconductor revolution. Today we're looking at multiple billion transistors. The average audio amplifier that you might have in your car would have more transistors in it than the Apollo Moon Rockets microprocessor would have that took it to the moon. I think it's the ghost of the machine. We take it for granted, it's like the air or, or gravity. I don't think we recognize because they've been so ubiquitous that we've come to take them for granted. Think about the first cars 
And then think about a car in the 1950s. You know, maybe there was a, a button to put the window down. And then think about in 2000s, you get the DVD players inside the car, the CD player, the automatic doors. And then today, think about a car. You know, you have the button for the trunk, the backup camera, the touch screen. In my personal opinion, we have created the monster. We are, we have a thirst for knowledge, we have a thirst for connectivity. So we made ourselves dependent on semiconductors, which is why we see a huge growth in semiconductors, which is why we see so much investment going into them. Because as we go further, our, our ability to be online and our craving for knowledge is also what's driving us forward. But our Achilles heel is we're reliant on this one particular device. The size of, of these chips, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're now down to atomic level. Then we see that the devices get smaller, the equipment to use to make it gets bigger, the new chemicals have to be developed, new um, you know, periodic table has to be expanded as we start developing different processes and so on. And that's why it continues to, to challenge the logistics supply chain. Supply chains in the current world are very complex. They span different continents, different time zones, different modes of transport, different people. So there's an estimate that one chip crosses an international border an average of 70 times and has about a thousand regulatory steps. One chip. The average smartphone has about a dozen chips. So do the math. It's substantial and that's just a smartphone. Right. Where do semiconductors come from? The starting point is mines. Right? There are these raw materials, including minerals, that are being mined in predominantly global South countries. And then there is the manufacturing of semiconductors, which has undergone the process of migration to East Asian countries because it is really labor extensive and polluting process. Just for context, in 1990, the US produced 37% of the world's chips. 10 years later, 2000s, it dropped to 19%. And then in 2010, it dropped to 13%. Where is that capacity going? Primarily to Asia Pacific region of the world. For years, we've tried to make things as efficient as possible, the entire supply chain, and we've put ourselves in a situation where most of the advanced semiconductors are produced in one place in the world, and that place is Taiwan. And if you consolidate things, you can make them very efficient but it also creates a challenge and a risk. There are two key categories of challenges facing the semiconductor supply chain. Those are black swan events and challenges and gray rhino. The term black swan comes from Nassim Taleb. It refers to events that are unpredictable, unprecedented and unique in nature. On the other hand, we have gray rhinos. This term was coined by Michelle Wucker in direct response to Talib's black swan. It's the analogy of a rhino on the horizon, quite far off, not presenting any danger, and then all of a sudden, it charges. I can think of no industry that is not dependent on uh, the computer chips that we get from that particular area. The stakes associated with a potential um, catastrophe of any kind could take down world industry. We cannot just say, oh, this is a European problem, this is an American problem, this is an Asian problem. This is a world problem. positive direction in terms of enhancing resilience of the semiconductor supply chain, I think it's worthwhile to look backwards and understand how it is where we got to where we are today. These decisions were intentional. They served a purpose at the time. And right now, perhaps we're seeing some of the pitfalls and downfalls, but I think it's important to take that into consideration as, as we look forward and, and make the next steps. In the very early days, if you had a, a microprocessor, you produced it yourself. Uh, what happened as the cost structure escalated and just really skyrocketed is that companies began to realize that they were better off farming the production of these uh, chips out to other companies, large companies that had already made that capital investment. 
they would send an electronic design for their chip to these manufacturers called foundries, and these foundries would then produce the chips. This model basically started roughly in the late 80s, but really took off in the 1990s. And as the cost of the state-of-the-art technologies became larger and larger, and foundries went from millions of dollars to billions of dollars to many billions of dollars, more and more companies abandoned their own production in-house and started consolidating the production in just a very few number of uh, foundries throughout the world. There are no easy answers to the problem. Um, we, on one side, we need to create more resilience in the supply chain that we have and the situation we are in right now, hoping that no adverse event happens and we can continue with production where it happens and more visibility to other stakeholders. Midterm to long term, we're looking at options to diversify where production of these semiconductors happens. Here in the US, we've had a CHIPS Act where we've invested, I think it's $52 billion in there. There's similar legislation that's come out of South Korea, out of Taiwan itself, out of Europe, uh, and different places throughout the world where there's been this investment in trying to diversify the manufacturing base. Making a chip is a very complicated task. You need complicated design software, producers that take the design and make it a real chip, but these producers actually rely on tool makers that produce very complicated tools. There's no one single entity that can do all that. To operate this machinery to design and manufacture package, then the logistics of shipping requires high level skill. You're not going to get that overnight. Uh, just to give you a feel for the magnitude of the problem, uh, the number of specialized technicians that will be needed for the upcoming foundries that we will have very shortly in the United States, we're about a thousand, sorry, a hundred thousand short of just the technicians that would work in these, these facilities. If you look at the, by the end of the decade, uh, the need for engineers to run these facilities, we're going to be, uh, unless things change dramatically, we're going to be about 300,000 short. For me, right now, the CHIP Act development is more the competitive race. If we're steering it, at least in a multilateral level, I think it can work out. But if we're completely losing behind big regions of the world that are not as resource intensive in terms of the monetary power or the development level, then it's just going to have a new unhealthy dynamic. It is industrial policy that are being very much constructed in the framework of great power competition between the United States and China, and it's a form of economic nationalism. And then when we think about can economic nationalism actually bring us more safety? Can, can it actually bring us more resilience in the moment of planetary disasters? And the answer is actually no. The stakes are huge because the semiconductor industry fundamentally impacts economic competitiveness as well as national security. So the stakes could not be higher. But I think it's important to remember that resilience is not about eliminating risk, but rather improving capacity to react, pivot, and bounce back in a reasonable manner. Uh, resilience. Instead of um, interpreting that as the average person might, as just surviving adversity. In the semiconductor field, you have to always be pressing forward because if, if you don't innovate, you die. I hear the word resilience all the time. We have to build economies of uh, resilience. We have to build brands and businesses that are resilient. And the problem with resilience, it means you're going to be tough. You're somehow going to resist the future. Well, we have a problem we can bounce back, right? And that, which means you're just returning to the status quo. And I don't think resilience is about bouncing back to where we were. It's about bouncing forward to where we need to go. Mm -hmm.